Okay, so let's go ahead and start with an introduction to Serial EM. And um, Cindy has prepared um, a series of videos um, that are now on our YouTube site, and I'm going to be showing most of those, but one I'm not going to show is her little tour of Serial EM, which is very nice for somebody who has not seen the program before. I'm going to do sort of a tour that just gives a little more detail about some of the more important features of the different components. Uh, just to orient you, this is the program. This is um, the, um, it's organized with a series of control panels on the left, uh, which you can float and position elsewhere on the screen. You'll be seeing that happen. And um, of course, there's the menu, which has lots of commands in it that are used less often. Many of the control panels can open and close their option sections to access options. And then, of course, the main important component here is the image display window in the middle. Now, rather than displaying images in multiple buffers, what we have is a, an image display window that, uh, rather than putting them in multiple windows, uh, we have a, a single window that displays multiple buffers. And you can scroll through the buffers with uh, hotkeys and, other, and by other means. So these buffers are referred to as A through P. And new camera acquisitions and processed images always go originally into buffer A. And what happens then is that whatever is in A gets scrolled down to B and B gets scrolled down to C to as far as you've selected to have this scrolling set of buffers. And below that, the buffers are, are preserved as you take new images. And in the typical situation, which is enforced during the tilt series, um, the uh, buffer D is used for an alignment reference, and buffer E is where things get read into. Um, okay. <clears throat> so moving down the panels and making some points about them. Um, if you look at the image display control panel, every time you, you take a new image, you'll see new numbers show up in these black and white boxes here. And um, what this means is that this is the range of data values that are being displayed on the screen as 0 to 255. And everything below the black level and above the white level are truncated at black and white. And the program analyzes a central area of the image, looks at the pixels there, and figures out what settings will truncate a certain small fraction of the pixels. And that usually works pretty well. You can actually type numbers into these boxes if you want to see contrast at the end of the range, beyond the range um, that's being shown. Um, more useful than that, in a general sense, is to adjust the area fraction, that's this button down here, um, to select a smaller area value so that basically it's like spot metering on a smaller center, central area. Uh, and that's usually the most successful for seeing um, what's inside of a cell that's embedded in resin uh, <clears throat> that's, that's taking up too much of the area around it. Uh, OK, then we have the microscope status panel. This has a couple of little cryptic buttons. The float button will take this, this screen meter, and it will float it on a separate little window that you can position right next to where you're looking while you're tuning the microscope. Uh, the dose button floats another little window that shows a cumulative dose, and you'll be seeing that in some of the videos. Uh, the defocus readout, labeled DEF, is um, <clears throat> um, I'm distracted because I would like to remember how to make PowerPoint use my pointer, keep my pointer as a pointer instead of continuing to hide it. So that's, if Cindy wants to run in here and help me do that, that would be great. But other than that, um, I'll just keep talking. So defocus is a whoops is is based on the microscope readout. It's not the actual focus on the specimen. Right click on the screen. Right click on the screen. Yeah. yeah. And say pointer options. options. Oh. And options. Visible. Visible. Ah, thank you. Okay. What's going on? Why do I have a ringing sound? Somebody has Okay, sorry. 
So on an FEI scope, this readout is always going to match the reading that's in the microscope interface, and you can reset it either in the microscope interface or in serial EM. On the JOL, it's arbitrary because it just gets set to zero on the program startup, and you can um, reset it using the little button that we've put here for convenience. Now the AIS stands for image shift, and it's in microns, and it's always good to have an idea of how far out you are from the center, especially if you have a limited range. And it will be labeled PLA on the JOLs that use projector shift. Um, on FEI, we have a vacuum readout. Um, but also, we have here this spot. And this is not just labeling that this is the spot number, but also uh, it's colored to indicate whether the intensity is currently in the calibrated range for this spot size. Blue if it's calibrated, um, and orange if it's just outside the range, but somewhat accessible in the agenda when it's uh, really outside the range. Okay. Um, next, uh, very important panel is the camera and macro controls. And um, it has cameras. It has buttons for starting the, uh, the camera parameter setup dialog, which is, we'll come to in a moment. And five buttons for the five different camera acquisition modes that they all have independent parameters. The stop button is a general purpose stop button that will stop all kinds of operations, um, except image acquisition is hard to stop sometimes because you've told the camera to go off and do something. <clears throat> um, this preview button, which is one of the um, camera modes, will morph into montage when you montage, unless you're in low dose where preview is a more important uh, button to have available. Um, the macro buttons at the bottom uh, show the names of macros. So there are ways that you can run uh, the macros. There's up to 20 different macros, which is just little text commands uh, that you can enter. And you can dial up which one is shown here, or you can have a toolbar shown that shows them all. And uh, if there's a name defined in the macro, it will show up in the button. Now, these buttons get hijacked and turned into other things during tilt series and a few other operations. So this is what they look like during tilt series. OK, so camera parameter setup, you'll go into this dialog a lot. <clears throat> and I'll just make a few uh, points about what's in here. Um, binning is a very important thing with CCD cameras. Uh, and we use it for speed, basically, because the CCD can bin at before it has to read the data out, and this makes it all come out much faster. In addition, internally, the program will bin data in order to do computations faster. So the tracking correlations are almost always binned down to a size of 512 pixels. And so in one sense, there's no point in taking trial images that are used for tracking that are any bigger than 512. 1024 is, is fine, because it's going to look better if you have a fast enough camera. <clears throat> The size of the area can be selected with a number of different buttons here. The, the, the most popular sizes, of course, are the quarter, half, and full. You may have wondered, why do we have wide sizes on here? Well, the rationale for that is, is with a standard CCD camera, um, the readout time is fastest if you're reading out an entire width of image, at least the readout time per pixel. So this is sort of the most efficient way to get um, fast pictures out is to use the somewhat wider than square pictures. In addition, uh, once you have a sub area selected, you can actually um, move it around or recenter it with these arrow buttons, which is handy when you're doing low dose focusing and you want to move the focus area over to another uh, more tempting bit of information. Now, dark references are something you need to keep in mind, too. Uh, a dark reference always has to be subtracted from the image you're acquiring. And it takes as long to acquire as an image itself, so we don't want to be taking those before every image acquisition. Uh, when you have the program set up so that it normalizes images in serial EM, it keeps track of dark references. And it can keep uh, a separate one for every binning and exposure time that you've been using up to a certain point. Uh, when, you know, the oldest ones will be thrown away as it runs out of memory. Um, 
And the way to get rid of dark references is to use this forced new dark reference next time. Now, um, pre-exposure, referred to as drift settling, is very important for doing any kind of plastic section tomography because what happens is that the beam first hits the specimen, it will charge up a bit and, sh and drift for a couple of tenths of a second. <clears throat> and almost always, to do any kind of pre-exposure requires that you have two shutters, one shutter above the specimen that can open before the exposure itself and pre-expose the specimen, and then a shutter below the specimen that doesn't open until we're ready for the, for the actual acquisition on the CCD. Um, now, historically, the uh, Gatan cameras have a shuttering mode that does allow pre-exposure, but it's a very inflexible and exposes the specimen during the um, camera readout, which can be a number of seconds. So long ago, I developed this method of using beam blanking, both to provide the pre-exposure before the uh, actual exposure that you want, and also to provide for blanking during readout. And so if you have a drift settling and you have this dual shuttering minimum exposure selected, it will use that method, and this will provide uh, just the amount of exposure that's needed with a little bit of, of uh, extra to avoid chopping off the image acquisition. And if you don't have a drift settling, then it will fall back to using a beam shutter. And so this is a good all-purpose setting if it's, if it's uh, available with a Gantan camera. Now, other vendors' cameras, such as FEI and TEATS, uh, do pre-exposure without this. And um, it's, so that, that's a situation pre-exposures. 